In Warhammer 40k, the Imperial Fists are one of the most famous chapters of the Imperium, a potent stalwart force of castellans and fortress builders, fighting from their fortress monastery of the Phalanx and defending the walls of terror. And while some of that's been the case since they were formed, back in the days of the Great Crusade, well, they were a lot more than that. Hi, uh, welcome to Heresy 101. In this little series, I'm going through all the lore for all of Warhammer's Space Marine legions, particularly their origins before the Horus Heresy broke out. I'll take a look at where they are at the start of it and how they got there, and then what happens to them during the Heresy. So be warned that this video contains spoilers for the Horus Heresy Black Books and the Black Library novel series, and probably anything else about to be released. At the conclusion of the Horus Heresy, the Imperial Fists were one of the few chapters left standing, and even then only barely, holding the line at terror until the very, very end. Their Primarch masterminding the doomed defence, and them finding himself responsible for rebuilding. But rebuilding was something the Imperial Fists could do. The history of the Imperial Fist starts, as with all the legions, during the Unification Wars on Terra, as the Emperor supplemented his armies of Thunder Warriors and unmodified human troops with the new Astartes pattern. And the Seventh Legion embodied the dreams of unity more than most. They recruited widely from all over ancient Earth in large numbers. The processes used to activate the gene seed of the lost Seventh Primarch seemed to be much more painful than those of other legions, and so wherever on Terra they came from, the warriors who made it through the gruelling surgeries tended to be those with the greatest endurance, stoic, taciturn and serious. In battle, the Seventh Legion were empire builders and crusaders, practical and pragmatic. They didn't just conquer new lands, they brought them into the Imperium permanently, fortifying their new conquests, installing bastions and keeps and garrison forces before pushing on across the wastes of terror, dedicated not only to expanding the borders of humanity's new empire, but holding it. And this zeal for conquest stayed with them as they were deployed into the Great Crusade. They fortified and reinforced the new worlds and systems they defeated. They didn't concern themselves with administration or civilian government, just providing the military strength to make sure that the rule of the Imperium held. And they did this well. Early on it had been noted that the lands they took were so firmly held it was as if the hand of the Emperor descended and gripped them with an unbreakable fist. And early in the Crusade, that had become their official name, the Emperor's Imperial Fists, conquering the stars, setting watch over them, and then forging onwards. This constant push forward, this constant Crusade, also came with another requirement, recruitment. Like on Terra, the Imperial Fists pulled new recruits from across the galaxy, often testing whole generations for entrance into the Legion as new worlds were pulled into compliance. Their bastions and watchtowers were as much supply stations as defences, whittling down the huge numbers of recruits to only those most suitable for the Seventh Legion and providing a constant supply chain of reinforcements to feed their crusade. This practical, zealous drive onwards became their hallmark and gave them a character that would mesh well with that of their Primarch. Near the end of the Unification Wars on Terra, the 20 Primarchs were scattered through the warp in a great conspiracy, landing on various human worlds across the galaxy, but few of those worlds were as harsh and deadly as the landing site of the 7th Primarch, Inwit. Imwit was a frozen world, locked in orbit around a dying star. Its people were expert survivors, raised on a planet where a single mistake could mean death, and constantly moving in clans through the underground ice hives that dotted the habitable half of the planet. Giant relics of a forgotten time before old night. The seventh Primarch was adopted by one of the clans, being named Rogel of the House of Dawn, and eventually he grew not only to lead the clan, but also the planet and its small empire. Over the course of their isolation, the clans of Imwit had spread out as much as they could into the stars. The Imwit cluster was home to the wreckage of long-abandoned human starships, and the clan slowly brought them back to life, regaining long-lost technical knowledge with each ship, and Rogel Dawn only pushed this further as ancient space stations like the Phalanx were reactivated and the worlds of the Inwit Cluster ringed with orbital defences. When the Emperor arrived, he regained not only a lost sun, but the strength of a star-spanning society that had already been forged into a tool of war. 
Few integrations of Primarch and Legion were as swift or as complete as that between the Rogal Dawn and the Imperial Fists. The ideals of the Imperium and the purpose of the Great Crusade fitted with Dawn's outlook and drive, and the warriors of the Imperial Fists were exemplars of not only everything that he had built in the Inwit Cluster, but everything he dreamed of for its future. This was still early in the Crusade, and over the next century and a half, the Imperial Fists became a famed and highly esteemed legion. They fought their own campaigns across the Crusade, fortifying and moving on as they'd always done, but since their ideals so closely aligned with the Emperor, they were often used as his personal hand, dispatched to key worlds to ensure compliance was achieved in the way he wanted, in a way most becoming to the Imperium, or dispatched to reinforce flagging wars or failing expeditions with their dependability and the strength of their colossal armada. The shipcraft of Imwit had made them masters of naval warfare. Many of their conquests became sources of new recruits, whole companies being made up of the children of specific worlds, lending many of the Imperial Fist's formations unique mannerisms and tactics. Their diverse recruiting base was only matched by much larger legions like the Ultramarines or Wordbearers. But while they were a highly favoured legion, that status could also breed resentment amongst their fellow legions, and it didn't help that Rogal Dawn, while fair and even-handed, could also be blunt and uncompromising. He was no diplomat. Like his sons, he often seemed emotionless or brooding and hid his feelings well. Underneath all this, he was an idealist, keen to ensure the righteousness of the wars he fought, but on the surface, he was straightforward in a way that could, maybe unintentionally, cause conflict. He clashed repeatedly with Comrade Kurz and other Primarchs he saw as less disciplined, less noble, but his most famous rivalry was with Perturabo of the Iron Warriors. Though the two Primarchs initially appeared to have quite similar preferences and methods, their shared stubbornness and bluntness meant that any dispute quickly became a long-held grudge. So while Rogaldorn was one of the Emperor's most favoured sons, it was Horus Lupercal, a much more diplomatic figure, that was named Warmaster. Instead, Dawn and his Imperial Fists were named Praetorians of Terror, and returned with the Emperor to become Castellans of the Solar System and the Imperial Palace. At the start of the Heresy, the Imperial Fists were estimated to have an active strength of just under 100,000 Legionnaires. Despite their wide recruitment pools, they were never the largest Legion. Though they still had expeditionary forces campaigning at the edge of the galaxy or garrisoning Legion fortresses, much of their strength by this point was concentrated on Terra and across the solar system. The Legion had kept much of the initial Legion structure they'd left Terra with. Rogal Dawn saw no need to change something that worked so well. The Imperial Fists operated as a massed shock assault force, utilising heavy armour and with a preference towards precise and reliable heavy weaponry and heavy infantry assaults. They were early adopters and huge proponents of Terminator armour, particularly the Indomitus pattern, and the first ones to field test weapon systems like the Storm Shield or Assault Cannon in large numbers. Above the squad level, their formations were quite fluid, based around the company, crusade, or household, depending on the role, and the size of these formations could vary with recruitment. They were led by masters, castellans, or seneschals, each expected to be capable of operating independently or seamlessly integrating their commands around their primarch when need required. There was no inner circle of senior officers for Rogal Dawn, but the most brilliant officers in the Legion were often made either fleet masters or siege masters, two methods of war in which the fists excelled. There were numerous additional formations and groupings across the Legion, many of which were only known to the Legion itself, but the most famous was the Templars, who guarded the Temple of Oaths on the Legion's flagship, the ancient Imwit Star Fortress Phalanx. The Templars were considered exemplars of the Fists, dedicated and zealous crusaders with decades of experience, and their master was traditionally the first captain of the Legion. Their story during the Heresy stretches from the very start to the very, very end. Magnus the Red's warning on terror had breached the seals around the Emperor's Webway project, forcing the Emperor and the Legio Custodes to fight a war in the Webway against the forces of Chaos. So, as Praetorian of Terror, it was Rogal Dawn who assumed command of the Loyalist forces. It was Dawn who received the message that Horus had turned traitor, and who dispatched seven legions to stop him on Isfan V, and the Imperial Fists who oversaw the fortification of the Imperial Palace and the solar system when Isfan V failed. Early in the war, they fought on Mars to recover war material for the Loyalist cause, and at Fall, where their fleet, becalmed on the way to Isfan, were ambushed by the Iron Warriors, and Imperial Fist garrisons across the galaxy defended their Legion fortresses against traitor attacks. But their most famous role would be at the end, during the Solar War and the Siege of Terror itself. 
As Horus's forces closed in on Terra, Rogal Dawn and the Imperial Fist turned the entire solar system into a fortress. The Imperial Palace itself, constructed on a flattened plateau made from what was once the Himalayas, was rebuilt, its beautiful architecture dismantled or hidden away behind thick walls and gun emplacements. The processional gates and arches that ringed the inner palace were converted into the colossal keeps of Gorgon Bar, Colossi and Marmax. The outer palace, a sprawling metropolis dedicated to Imperial administration and home to the spaceports of Eternity Gate and Lions Gate was ringed with walls. But further than this, the whole solar system was turned into a series of concentric defence rings, from the fourth sphere at Mars to the first sphere defences of Pluto, where the Imperial Fist attempted to hold the advance of the War Master's armies and where, during the Battle of Pluto, Rogal Dawn killed the 20th Primarch, Alpharius. But the Loyalists were hopelessly outnumbered. Only the Fists, the White Scars and the Blood Angels had made it back to Terra to aid in the defence, and by this point they were up against nine traitor legions. Ever pragmatic, Dawn fought this part of the war as a series of delaying tactics, a race against time in the hope that legions like the Ultramarines or Dark Angels would make it back to Terra. As the traitors ground on through all the spheres of the solar system, it was the Imperial Fists who coordinated the defence of the palace against the siege craft of Perturabo and his Iron Warriors, holding out as the noose tightened. And when it became apparent that reinforcements were not coming, and the Emperor finally emerged to lay low Horus, it was Rogal Dawn who accompanied his father onto the War Master's battle barge, and Rogal Dawn who found the mortally wounded Emperor in the aftermath and delivered him onto the Golden Throne, where he sits all the way into the 41st millennium. And that's the Seventh Legion, in many ways the model of an Astartes Legion, a force of disciplined conquerors and zealous crusaders built out of warrior traditions from all across the galaxy and led by a Primarch who, in many ways, was everything the Emperor ever wanted them to be. And though they were later split into the successor chapters we know from 40k, many of those chapters owe their origins to that diversity of recruitment and their continued existence to those qualities the Seventh Legion exemplified of careful strength and endurance. Thanks for watching. So if you'd like more Heresy, there's another little video coming up just there. And if you'd like to see these videos early or support the channel, then there's a Patreon link down in the thing below. See you later.